Hey, Rich. Hey, Mike. How are you? <laughs> How's it going? That's good. It's good. Uh, yeah. Here we are, uh, <laughs> middle of October. October surprise season. Surprise! Oh, so many surprises, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, good surprises. Uh, and yeah, here we are uh, in the middle of the, or toward the end of actually, the game theory in the Age of Chaos uh, campaign and Shark Dot Vote and all the other cool stuff. If you haven't gotten your ballot yet, uh, sit by the door. It's coming. Uh, it will be coming. If you, have, if you have gotten your ballot, why are you listening to us? Fill it out. Get it in the mail. <laughs> that was such a good feeling. Oh, my God. Like, just just filling in those dots and getting it ready to mail. I was so excited. And it happened right in the middle of the vice presidential debate, which was, like, double good. <laughs> did, that, did, that, did the vice presidential debate change your opinion? Yeah, did it, it wasn't. Change you? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure, and then uh, then I watched that, and that no, <laughs> that that settled it. Huh? You voted for the fly, exactly. Sealed yeah. the deal. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I hope you put it in one of those California GOP uh, boxes oh, they got. Okay. <sighs> no, California. <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> That's all you need to say. I'm well, so I'm in used Seattle. To... We haven't gotten our ballots yet, so oh, okay, we're, okay. We're, we, we hear they're on their way. We're, we're all excited. About Good. getting to vote in this election, which uh, I don't think I need to tell anybody who's watching this uh, pretty darn consequential election in a lot yeah. of ways. Yeah. yeah. So what we're going to do here uh, is we're going to talk about game theory and how it applies to this election. And who <laughs> knows and who knows where else we'll go. But but, yeah. you know, that's the that's the thing that's on our minds. Mm -hmm. It feels like we've been right. doing this for some time now. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. So, in case anybody hasn't, uh, anybody's catching up on this, um, you know, I was just a humble game designer playing my trade. Mm -hmm. tick, 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 like you right? do? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, um, then the political world went kind of crazy. And I was like, well, I could just walk outside and scream every morning that uh or uh in consultation with my friend rich here i was like well let's uh, maybe maybe instead of that uh i could write some pieces about game theory and how it works and the reason i asked rich uh is because i'm a game designer and rich is an actual game theory <laughs> trained human being Right. Yeah, I've been teaching it in in schools. So getting to, you know, all this stuff with kids is uh, is wild. Right. <laughs> schools are those places where kids go in the daytime after they right? leave their house. No, they're in their house. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little confused what school is, but I'll, yeah, I'll figure it out. It's a little confusing, I think, these days. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so Rich is a serious game design, uh, game theory game theorist team theorist is, sure <laughs> has a site called atomic game theory lots of cool stuff on there and i oh, was like you. well i'm you know i've been learning at you know from rich and from other people about how game theory works and applying it in my game design can i apply it to the real world which is what game theory is supposed to be about so much and harder. uh yeah and and so you know we just started doing it and eventually we had a bunch of columns out there that people were reading and we flipped it into a, a small book uh some like two years ago mm -hmm. uh this book game theory in the age of chaos um and then uh just kept at it rich would every time i would write an essay i'd write i'd pick a subject uh that required some um scholarly understanding <laughs> right it was well, mostly, we, way, like you there would be all your links in the essay which were fantastic and i loved and i used so much as i just kind of dived in and tried to explain it in just in a second way everybody needs st stuff explained two different ways right <laughs> yeah well usually right it's like well what mike really means to say here is <laughs> sure if mike if mike <laughs> had had even the slightest bit of formal training <laughs> It was. He fun. would say the follow. He would say no, but it's it's good. Uh, it's really good to to um, because in the in the essays, you know, I can't go into 
what what these things mean I, I just sort of throw them out there and say okay well this is the basis for why i think the following conclusions mm -hmm. are legitimate and you can go in and say all right here's here's some meat to this right. here's here's how this really works right um you know and so and we've gone all over the place that's really true. Like there's, you know, when I think about game theory and all the little pieces, the, the specific scenarios and conflicts we can talk about, like we, yeah. we talked about them. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and yeah. Some. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering like, like, okay, so we got, as we were getting to the end of this book, right. It, you know, we're like, okay, do we leave anything out? Right. Yeah. Like, is there, like, is this now a primer <laughs> on like, is it sort of a disguised game theory 101 textbook <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I think it is i think we've got most of the chunks there i mean i don't yeah. as i as i go through it if you, hmm, if i were going to teach like one hour long session and i just needed to hit bullet points for sure i think we've got them maybe we've missed like a small you know right. week nine topic but <laughs> <laughs> week nine yeah exactly exactly yeah <laughs> Yeah, so uh, okay. so we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on now and, you know, just use some examples from the book, uh, but also just, you know, in real life uh, to analyze where we are with, uh, what, as we're recording today, I believe it's 17 days left till the election. I know it feels good, right? We're no longer talking <laughs> about months or years. Like, <laughs> right. You can you can start to say there is an end in sight. Right. We don't actually know uh, at this point what the next phase will nope. be, <laughs> but we know this phase will end. Mm -hmm. Right. Like we've gone, um, we've gotten roughly to the end of the four years that Trump was elected for. Right. And so we don't know what's on the other side of that. You know, it could be four more years of this, right? It could be that we change uh, horses and still have all the problems, Yeah. right? It could be that we change horses and we don't have those problems, but we have all new problems. And it could be that we change horses and we get, you know, a totally, you know, a firm, you know, a, a really well uh, structured society that that doesn't really have a lot of these problems right i mean like right. like we just can't know no we can't we can't i mean yeah let's hope that we get to still use the phrase october surprise and not replace it with november surprise <laughs> november surprises <laughs> yeah in weird way weirdly like um you know we've been doing these i i've been calling them doomsday scenarios right like like mm -hmm. there's and then not just me, not just you, just lots and lots of journalists or writers have been writing about like what happens if these totally norm violating uh, sequences occur. Right. And everything about the previous 47 months tells us we don't have any idea. No, no. Right. Something's going to happen and we're just going to go, well, darn it. I never saw that coming. Right, which has been really interesting because we're, as we're looking at game theory, we're supposed to be used to looking at rational outcomes, like finding out what the consequences of actions are. And, you know, right. we had talked about when we were talking about impeachment, we were talking about what are the real consequences. I don't think either of us would have said nothing. There are none. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. Conversations. <laughs> exactly. That's right. The first essay in the book is um, called Game Theory and the Two Magic Words That Will Impeach Trump. And at that point, what we were imagining was that impeachment would lead to a differently defined space in some way. Either, um, you know, impeachment would go through and then we'd have a different president or we'd have some sort of negotiation phase right. where, where, you know, Pence would take over or, or something, right? Um, that we had at the same time shortly thereafter uh uh the robert Mueller probe mm -hmm. and we sort of looked at that and we're like okay well we can imagine how this causes uh the coalition uh coalitions to act in a way that um that would 
uh, you know, would produce a different outcome. What we got yeah. out of both of those things instead was just sort of a super empowered presidency. Right. Like, like I'm not saying that they were bad ideas. I'm not saying we shouldn't have mm-hmm. investigated. We shouldn't have impeached. Right. I'm, I'm merely saying that the end result was the president looks around and becomes even more bold. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Which I just hadn't quite thought would be one of, and as the, you know, these four years have continued, it's been, oh yes, of course that will be an outcome that we need to consider is just nothing happens except the president becomes bolder about <laughs> yeah, yeah. the next yeah. thing. <laughs> Well, we had this thing, I mean, one of the things that we talk about really early on, and I can't imagine there's any game theory textbook that doesn't get into this within the first 10 or 15 pages, mm-hmm. is that is the concept of the prisoner's dilemma. Yeah. Uh, why don't you give the short version of that? Right. So the prisoner's dilemma, you know, a consequence, uh, a situation that happens all the time is <laughs> two, <laughs> two prisoners. Uh, separated in, in two different holding cells and the uh, the authorities come in and say, look, we're going to make you a deal. And if you talk, if you rat out your friend, uh, we will give you a significantly reduced sentence. Um, we might even let you walk right out the door right now, you know, depending on, on what's up. Um, and uh, but if you don't, you know, you're going to jail. And I don't tell you as a prisoner that I'm also giving the same deal to the other prisoner. And my hope is the authorities is that you rat each other out. Because if you do, you both get a super bad sentence. Um, you know, let's call it like an eight-year sentence. Um, but if you decide to stay silent, you get out with zero. Uh, you get to walk right out the door, and your friend gets the entire rap. It gets like a 10 or a 12-year sentence, something huge. Mm. Um, if you both stay quiet, you both go to jail for a little while. But I, I don't learn the details. And so maybe you're both in there for only like two years. Right. And the dilemma there is that everyone wants the best outcome for themselves, which is game theory 101 right there. And if you both choose the best outcome, which is ratting on your friends, you actually both go to jail terribly for eight years. Um, Yeah, but it's better. Like it's, it's amazing that, that, you know, we look at these things from the point of view of rational actors Mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know, making what I think people would call logical choices, right? And uh, the logical choice in that case is to to not be a stand up friend. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. And and the the political world is not filled with situations where being a stand up friend is your best move. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's a really weird kind of environment when when you sort of accept that as a basic principle. Like mm-hmm. just a couple of days ago. Um, yesterday, I think the, uh, the Amy Coney Barrett hearings came to an end and Diane Feinstein, your, your, sta- your state Senator. Um, I know, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna hurt. Um, I'm from Oregon. <laughs> I, I know, I know, I know. Right. Yeah, Berkeley's down. It's, it's good. It's yeah. great. It's great. So, um, so, um, uh, she's the ranking minority member on the judiciary committee. Stands to become, in the new Senate, the majority member, right? Mm-hmm. Ranking member. Yeah. Um, gets to the end of it and says to Lindsey Graham, who's the minor, or the majority uh, ranking member, uh, this is one of the best hearings that I've ever yeah. been in. Uh, and yeah. then hugs Lindsey Graham. Right. Now... Let me just take that entire scenario, right? It all just seems like, how could this be a positive thing, mm-hmm. right? So I'm going to take some words out of that that thing. I'm going to take yeah. senator away. Sure. Right? Just going to take that. But I'm going to keep 87-year-old okay. in that, right? Uh, Lindsey Graham, I think, is in his mid to late 60s. I can't remember exactly. Um uh, and I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to put back in um, the in context of this, which is against a uh, environment where seniors are dramatically affected by COVID-19, right? And a couple days before that, Lindsey Graham essentially pulled out of a debate because he didn't want to get tested for COVID-19. Yeah. Um, 
And imagine hypothetically that uh, Lindsey Graham had just gotten the news that he wasn't tested positive for this, right? And his colleague at work found out about this and said, this is great news. I'm glad you're okay. And gave him a hug, right? Mm-hmm. Well, that's actually kind of what went down, Yep. right? Yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, he's not positive for coronavirus. There's a big fear that he was. Mm-hmm. They're both quite old. They're both tested, presumably, a lot. Um, sure, yeah. <laughs> and they work together on a daily basis. And, you know, they're both... They're both in this terrible age cohort where the worst could happen. Well, the reaction was not like that, right? Of course. The reaction yeah. was, how dare you make friends with the enemy when the enemy's position is so dangerous for the country, Yeah. right? And so game theory requires us to put ourselves in that mindset all right. the time. And it's it's interesting because it, we also have to analyze, you know, the the players and outside factors. When you look at the the prisoners' dilemma, and I know this is you brought this up in an essay about, uh, uh, oh my gosh, it was Cohen. Um, but uh, right. the, the mentality of the mob mentality, the the on the outside, if you if you snitch on your friend, that's a big deal. That's a problem in a world we're not considering right now, and right. Uh, and so it, it makes it really difficult to analyze. When are two players enemies, and when are they actually kind of working on the same team? <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of like sports teams, right? The players have a strong reason to want their side to win. Often it's financial or legacy or, or just, just simply wanting to win, right? But, mm-hmm. but they fundamentally they know they can change teams they know that that right. they're you know they're that the it isn't the it isn't life and death that they be on one side or another they have to and we can't perceive that about our politicians at all that's true i mean we, yeah in fact a team change is is a huge deal so. right i mean justin amash went from being not a republican to a Democrat, but a Republican to a Libertarian? I don't know. Yeah, right? Maybe. Still seemed like cataclysmic change. Absolutely. Right? It went for, you know, I don't know all the senators' names. I know that one, and that's the reason why. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, Representative Jeff Van Drew did make the change from from Democrat to, to Republican, and we're just like, nope, that's no. Yeah. He's not, we, no, we can't, he's the worst, right? He's right. worse than right. even the people who showed up as Republican on day one, right? Because he's taken one of our seats, mm-hmm. occupied it, and then switched it to the other team. We yep. didn't even get to vote. Oh. You know, that, 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 and so we don't, we don't perceive it that way. We feel we, and so game theory in our case was just like, we, it's black and white. Um, we expect people to behave in very specific rational ways where rational is defined by the worst possible environment. That's right. That's and why right. we use things like the prisoner's dilemma, which as you noted, is a you know, very common life scenario. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can't even come up with one time in my life I was in a prisoner's dilemma. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, it's kind of our bedrock principle. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And it's, yeah, one of the reasons I think is because it's game theory is is we call it game theory. I wish it was called conflict theory because that's what it's about, right? All these things are about these moments when players interact and not necessarily in positive. Let's let's hug it out sort of ways. There's a lot of you know, uh, I'm trying to get the best for me. It's a you know zero sum games. Throw out all these ideas where if I don't get what's good for me, that things are really really bad then. And um, and yeah, there's a lot of conflicts that we have that come up way more often than the prisoner's dilemma in our lives. Uh, but it's the first one we know because it is kind of the catchiest one. It's the biggest, like, Ooh, interesting. I'm ready. <laughs> I think and it makes a lot of sense. I think the Trump presidency, it's good that you brought up zero, zero, sum game, zero, sum thinking, because this presidency more than any other in my lifetime has been about that, right? There is no world in Trump's head where if you win, he doesn't lose right yeah and i just don't i don't remember 
any political landscape that felt like that before. Right. I mean, like, right. sure. There are tough decisions to be made when we talk about um, the pandemic later in the book, you know, we talk about uh, the trolley problem, right? The trolley problem. Uh, again, I should always defer to you every, <laughs> I should never try to explain something to oh, you. It's okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Our, our trolley problem is the, the scenario where you have the option to take an action. Um, you realize that you are on a course, which is going to hurt uh, people. The trolley is going forward and it's going to run into five people. Um, you have the option to change the lever. So we'll go down this other track where for some reason there's also one person in the way, but it's just one person rather than five. And the trolley problem is, do you flip the, the switch? And then there's 50 million variations about right. what if it's 10 people? What if it's your grandmother? What if it's, you know, but uh, I love the problem because there's, there's all these different reactions to it. And one of them is, you know, that you should always take this action to do something. And there's also this, well, if I don't take an action, you know, I should never do an action to hurt people. Like there is this, right. this huge divide in how people look at this this problem. And it's cool because it we get to see those those philosophies kind of clash right there. So we get to the point where, you know, in real life, you know, we have to make decisions mm -hmm. about who gets scarce resources. Right. And the pandemic made that super clear on day one when you know, states were essentially told by the federal government, you're on your own, mm -hmm. get whatever materials you think are right for your citizens, you know, and so states were jockeying with each other to get N95 masks and, and ventilators and just, and, and we're just like, wait, this is a real zero sum game mm -hmm. now. There's a limited supply of these things and actors who want parts, you know, want that scarce resource. And if they get it, the other person, the other state doesn't get it. Yeah. And the reason that felt so wrong to everybody, it just, I, I, and I think it is morally wrong, um, is the federal government supposed to not let that happen? Right. Right. You know, if we're thinking about the trolley, the government exists to flip the lever. That's what they're there for and sure. move everything onto a track where we will take the responsibility. We think that this outcome, this action will hurt fewer people overall, but I have to make a decision to do it. And what we ended up getting is the other one. Like, it doesn't matter, you know, as painful as this is going to be, I'm not going to touch a lever because that's that action. You know, I, I don't have deniability then or whatever mm -hmm. the heck actually happened. You know, it's very clear, I think, that that things would have been switched <laughs> yeah. um, and our country would be in a better spot for it. Um, I think the uh, Bob Woodward book, particularly, but not just the book, but the interviews that mm -hmm. um, Bob Woodward did with the president in as going back as far as February, uh, January and February, both just, I mean, I don't, I don't know what moved the needle in this election, right? There's so many stimuli that mm -hmm. you could look at, but that one felt, particularly awful and yeah. keep, keeps getting brought up a lot, right? Is that the president was told in, you know, January, maybe December, um, that this disease was airborne and lethal and went on, you know, went on his uh, platform and basically said the opposite. Yeah. And... Yeah we were used to him lying like this wasn't like a shock from the point of view of i can't believe this president told us something false we had right. already moved well beyond that twenty thousand lies previous right but this particular lie was done in a way that made everyone feel like they could have made rational choices Mm -hmm. Not necessarily positive choice, not only not, you know, in a positive background, not, you know, not necessarily comfortable choices, but different rational choices as far back as uh, the winter. And we got told our opinion didn't matter. Right. Right. Um, and so that's that's why the trolley problem feels so so right there mm -hmm. is because 
we're getting the effects of having pulled the lever without actually ever having touched it. Yep. Yes. Oh. And that's, I mean, that's that's the worst. <laughs> like, like if you have it to is. go through the emotional roller coaster of of having to make the, you know, make the decision about whether or not you're gonna, you know, hurt one group or another group, mm -hmm. and then you make that decision, but you realize you never made the decision. Somebody else made it for you anyway. Right. Yeah. It doesn't make you feel better. Mm -mm. Right. And there's there's also this long, you know, discussion about what the consequences of actions are, and if. If I can't gauge those consequences, if I don't know, you know, mathematicians, game theorists want to put a number at the end of everything so that we can run some probabilities. But if if I can't trust the numbers I'm getting from the top levels, if my best understanding of it is I bet that guy's lying, then I don't know. How, right. You know, right. Especially when that, uh, that set of numbers is like, you know, it's supposed to come from the CDC and the Department of right. Health and Human Services right. and and the FDA and the EPA mm -hmm. and, and all of the other agencies that have just been crippled during yeah. this period of time. You know, I mean, simple things like does the uh, EPA's website refer to something called climate change is a, you know, I mean, like we all know any rational person who uh, who follows any sort of non QAnon based life, you know, uh, information flow. Sure. It has come into con contact with the idea that humankind causes uh, causes climate change, right? right. Um, um. You could decide that it doesn't match your goals to admit that out loud, right? You could say that because of your association with, you know, the oil and gas industry or, um, uh, you know, you're, you're, uh, uh, you're in West Virginia and you're dependent on coal and, you know, all sorts of reasons might exist for you to say, I don't want to tell people I believe that. Right. Right. But when you tell people you don't believe it and they earnestly do not believe it because they heard it from you what you have done is changed the environment in a negative way right it's no longer just a, a personal bit of like willful ignorance it is now you have just spread ignorance that's it that's right <laughs> you have you, you've and done you're it. coming at it from a willful level that's just where they are yeah it's it's malignant information mm -hmm. right and so you know we talk a lot about um transparency of information in this book you know whether or not the actors in question have all the information necessary to make decisions and um you know sometimes it doesn't matter sometimes they've already committed to a principle and and there's a lot of times when we don't you know it doesn't matter whether you're liberal or conservative you just don't want to hear it right you don't want to hear that there mm -hmm. might be something that causes you to reevaluate your position because right, you're not true. changing your position. Right. I mean, like it doesn't matter. And so, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I mean, we want to think that people are, you know, because we're game theorists, uh, rational actors who, who modify positions based on new sources of information. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that I think, that a great many people don't ever want that. That's, you know, that's a moment of weakness. Right. Yeah, in game theory, there are a number of strategies that are dominant, right? You would just choose that one and, and you would choose that forever. That's the way it is. And very often it is more of a mixed strategy. I should try this and then this and then this. And there are those moments where we allow people to waver in game theory. And uh, we're not seeing that so often in, in our politics these days. <laughs> no, it, it, like we've been talking about like the undecided voter a lot this election, right? And <laughs> Sure, yeah. <laughs> and it's just baffling to imagine yeah. that in these debates and town hall, or you know, these town hall settings, you know, they somehow managed to find somebody who is like, mm -hmm. who is like, well, they voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016, but they haven't quite made their mind up this year. Right. <laughs> and we just like, what? How? <laughs> How yeah. does that person exist? But they do. They must exist. They must. They definition. must. I, 
I don't know where they are. I really right. don't. <laughs> well, I guess NBC News is really good at finding them, right? That's true. But uh, but no, I mean that, that's that's one of the things. Is like the, for me, the October surprise uh, that's most significant is it might already be over. Like as I said, we're 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 in mid October right now. Mm-hmm. Twenty, I think twenty two million people have voted, which is about to break the record for a number of early voters ever. That makes sense. That makes which sense. is crazy. Yeah. It's it's mm-hmm. middle October, There's, right? Yeah. You should not be able to do that two and a half weeks out before an election. And already we're we're getting to the point where we're we're about to blow away the number of 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 early voters. And so so it's presumable that that's gonna continue and that we're gonna have an unbelievably high turnout. Um, you know, the, the numbers last time were that, um, Trump got about 60, 61 million votes. Clinton got about 63 million votes. The other candidates, you know, probably split, I don't remember, 10 million votes between them. Right. If we're, if we're South of 150 million votes, I'll be shocked. Yeah. And it would not surprise me if you told me if I you told me that you know in, on the November sixth that 180 million people had voted, and that that would be just unthinkable. I mean, three you know most of the <laughs> a lot of people don't quite understand. They look at it like, okay, well, geez, that still sounds like a small percentage of the country. There's a huge number of people in this country who can't vote. Oh, absolutely. Right? Some of absolutely. them are too young. Some of them are from somewhere else. Some of them, <laughs> uh, you know, obviously there's felony laws. There's just huge numbers of people who have opinions about the presidential election and are simply incapable yeah. of registering them at the polls. Mm-hmm. Right. And I mean, so, not even to, to mention the people who can't then get to the polls, you know, right. on, on election day to vote during that short window because the just number work, of people just the economy just everything yeah the number of people whose votes are disenfranchised the number mm-hmm. of people who, you know there's just a huge number of barriers in way of people mm-hmm. voting um some of them completely rational and so i mean we're not going to get to the 1860s although weirdly uh so the lincoln lincoln's election uh had 81 percent turnout which is i mean a number that we can't imagine but wow. it's important to understand what that was a percentage of right yeah 50 percent of the country was not getting to go to the polls true. because true. they were not biologically uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh in the list of people who could vote right and so yeah. so you know as we've as we've expanded that you know the the number of people that are going to register an opinion on this is off the charts and and it just seems completely insane to you and me that somebody would not have made this such an important element of their lives that they'd have made a decision by this point yeah yeah i it really does it's it's kind of you know we, i we've talked about it quite a bit but uh it's it's a little baffling almost that there's this much has happened this much has happened <laughs> right and uh, and they don't they don't know yet that's wild to me but yeah you know, that's well i mean i guess that's why you know that's why people's campaign contributions are still relevant right mm-hmm. i mean like you know there's advertising there's there's get out the vote efforts there's you know anti-disenfranchisement um uh efforts there's all sorts of things that are going on that that um even in the last days of an election are still super important um you know i think one of the things we're we there was this huge transition this year um when you know we spent a lot of time talking about what was going on in the primary democratic primaries because it really wasn't yeah. a republican primary there was there yeah. was there were some there were short of show there were a few other candidates it doesn't matter Right. Remember when I thought there might be another yeah. candidate? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we thought, yeah, we thought that, you know, somebody might take up the mantle of, you know, yeah. like, oh, let, what if we were running on a compassionate conservative agenda? No, that never right. happened. No. Never, no. never happened. No. <laughs> so, um, so all that got transported over into the Democratic primary where we had all sorts of game theory applicable behavior. Um, yeah. Where we had suddenly lanes pop up. Right, and that wasn't a term I remember prior to this year. No, maybe 
I don't, I mean, that may have existed, but I don't remember it. So lanes, lanes are like, well, there's a set of voters who are going to pick a type of candidate. Um, and only one person can occupy the lane that that type of voter will accept. And if there's more than one person in that lane, and then in another lane, there's only one person, mm -hmm. then the person in the lane that is uncontested is going to romp over the two people that are in the other lane, no matter what the position of those people are. Right. 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 And so we had a really interesting situation where the, um, the liberal lane, the, the uh, liberal is a weird term, the progressive lane, um, had two super powerful candidates in it, right? I mean, you're not going to find two more charismatic uh, people than Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. I mean, they captivated their audience, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But essentially, they were playing for the same group of people. Right. And I remember when I wrote a, a, a piece, uh, it's actually one of my favorites, uh, called The Progressive Voltron. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Where I was like, these two candidates have to become one candidate mm -hmm. or they're both going to lose. And I did a sort of little radio play at the front of it, which is really fun to write. But it was just <laughs> like, what would happen in the side conversation between Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders if they were... Um, electorally savvy enough to to join together in a way that made their followers agree that that was that whichever candidate came out of that particular group was going to win right and they they combined their electoral votes and they mm -hmm. they split their resources in an interesting way and all that right and i don't know if any of that was realistic right but it's important to understand that there was another candidate at that period of time that was jockeying for that lane and that was Kamala Harris. Right? I mean like That's she true, was yeah. she's mm -hmm. one of the most progressive uh senators there is and um and she could gain no traction whatsoever Great. in that lane. Just couldn't have it. And meanwhile, over in the other lane, and I'm sure there were other there were different lanes. There were more than two, but but two big ones. There was Joe Biden, obviously, but there was also Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar. Mm -hmm. And and I don't want to disparage any of those candidates. They were they were good candidates. They um they've they've proven their worth over and over again. They can mm -hmm. they can run sure. again, right? None of them was Bernie Sanders. That's none very of, true. None yeah. of them was Elizabeth Warren. Mm -hmm. They weren't negotiating with Joe Biden on an equal level. Even after Iowa, the complete cluster of a <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? so uh, the Iowa caucus has happened this year. <laughs> Does that seem like a million years ago? But the Iowa caucus wow. has happened this year. That's unbelievable. We were hearing about all these people all the time, right? And now, now they've just faded. <laughs> yeah, right. The Iowa caucuses were this this circumstance where the 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 voting system just completely broke down due to a crazy like a a, a an app created by a company called Shadow Inc. Oh, that's right. Why? Why? <laughs> Just, who's writing this? Unbelievable. <laughs> and so, so, but you know, there was that moment where like uh, Buttigieg was ahead, mm -hmm. right? And Biden's campaign was sputtering. And we were just right. looking around and we're like, this isn't reality. This is just, this, this, this is happening. We understand it. But I don't buy it. I don't buy it being real, <laughs> yeah. right? I don't buy it. And sure enough, you know, there was some. There was New Hampshire. Obviously, Bernie Sanders was going to do really well in New Hampshire. I mean, yeah. And then there was Nevada, and Elizabeth Warren killed a billionaire on screen. <laughs> <laughs> and that's right. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and so that was when we wrote. That was when we did that thing about the progressive Voltron. And we're mm -hmm. like, okay, well, you know, there's a there's a way here, but but Biden. You know, there's these two people who are down to really just 
three candidates in two lanes. The game yeah. theory says you have to act at this point. Um, and, you know, people were like, you know, the, the Elizabeth Warren came out of the debate and you thought she was the, the, you know, clear winner that came that, that, that game, that debate. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet the Bernie Sanders folks were online going, Elizabeth drop out. Yep. Cause they'd figured it out. They, they knew. They were a hundred percent right. Mm -hmm. Trump figured it out. He said, "He said, Elizabeth Warren, you got to drop out, or you're going to kill Bernie." And uh, that didn't happen. And we're mm -hmm. always in the mindset of like looking at these things and sort of treating the actors as if they're, you know, well, again, like sports teams members, right? People, right. people who don't have real. Uh, you know, it, real wants and needs and, 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 and so forth. So, you know, we can get in the mindset of saying, oh, t to the, to the woman who has gotten, you know, as far as just about any woman has gotten other than Hillary Clinton, mm -hmm. you know, oh, you should drop out. Right. right. And I know, I mean, this woman is inspiring, you know, millions. Right. Absolutely. Right? Like, <laughs> trying, trying to say, you know, it's kind of the same way that you know Justice Ginsburg, um, you know, people after say after she died were like saying, well, why didn't she resign during the Obama administration? I don't know because she liked her job, yeah, and she was absolutely she was inspiring <laughs> millions of people, and she was really good at it. Like you know, we're always in this mindset of like you should do the rational thing for the largest number of people and and forget that individuals are individuals yeah there's there's a lot to that and when we you know as a <laughs> as a game does like bringing it to the game level right we we see that when we look at people who they're they're choosing strategies in their games and if a game has two strategies and it's a three-player game you can kind of tell who's going to win at the start <laughs> once <laughs> yeah. you see that happen but when we apply that to this massive historic moment you know it doesn't it's a little harder <laughs> To yeah. Start saying you too. <laughs> I think to run for president, you have to be a bit of an egomaniac. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's really no place in running for president for people who don't have a massive sense of self. And right, that so, unwillingness to step back is, yeah. is a big part of it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like we're we're talking about you have to get out there and raise tens, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars basically on the principle that I am better than everyone else. I mean, that you got <laughs> you gotta have some massive interference loop in your brain to <laughs> no even <matter>. do <laughs> to even do the job. Not yeah. not at the level necessarily that Trump does, where it's clearly sure. like it's eliminated some other really helpful loops like shame and and uh, uh, res taking responsibility and things like that. Like we mm -hmm. can all look at that and know that that's abhorrent and right. an aberrant, right? But it isn't abhorrent to just think, well, this country depends on me. If I don't, if I don't do my job right, this it's all going to crash. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially why Biden got in the race. Right. Abs just this this knowledge that, wait, hold on, I've been there. I've done it right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Help do it right. You know, let's get back onto it. That's a, that's a hard argument, you know, to stand. <laughs> he can't, he can't just, <laughs> right? Biden got into the race because of, he watched what happened in Charlottesville, which was kind of the turning point for this book series or this essay series, right? Where we uh, did a thing called uh, Co-op Mode. Uh, why Trump sees uh, sees two sides, sees both sides in Nazi murder, right? I mean, yeah. like, right. And that was uh, one of the things where we realized, you know, you and I were talking like, this is a real thing. Like, we're not, I'm not just doing one-offs here. Mm -hmm. This is a, this is an important analysis um, and I, I want to do it right. And so, you know, because of the same sort of sense that those those presidential candidates have of like, if I don't do right. this, you know, it's not going to get told, right? Mm -hmm. And we sort of analyzed how co-op games work and how, uh, I remember you and I talking about, like, you know, uh, the pandemic problem. Yes, yes, right? our, our alpha player. <laughs> yeah, you want to explain what an alpha player is? Yeah, the, the idea that 
in a game um like like pandemic is is a good one uh one person can understand everything about the game and just tell you what to do so you as a as a player kind of surrender your autonomy kind of to this mastermind um, right and it stops being a co-op game it's just it's a single player game and there's four people there right right and i don't think we got a clearer example of that then you know so so that the, that happened obviously and the mm -hmm. the daily stormer went went crazy you know people are saying oh look he didn't condemn us he just condemned the anti-fascists you know now white supremacists are like well we've got a guy we've got our got our guy yeah mm -hmm. i'm not ever sure that he that trump set out to be that guy like because i don't think he knows any rank and file uh, you know, militia people. Sure. Right. Okay. He doesn't yeah. he doesn't associate with these people. He doesn't let them into his orbit. I'm sure they don't get invitations to the White House. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But early on, he realized this is the people who I'm cooperating with, mm -hmm. and uh, somewhere in there, it became apparent to him that if he acknowledged it out loud possibly at Charlottesville, that the world would come at him with knives, right? Because right, right. it's not cool. It's not okay, right? So we get to the first debate of this year, right? Um, you know, we get through three years yeah. of, of him equivocating on the subject of white supremacy. Right. Uh, and we get to this what I think is one of the most interesting and horrifying displays I have ever seen happen live in front of me, right? The only thing I can compare it to was uh, some, for some reason, I don't remember why, um, maybe, it, maybe it just started happening and I flipped over to it when the malice at the palace happened. Oh, fair enough. Okay. Right. Where you just, yeah. you know, the, the basketball teams had, had, had gotten in each other's faces and then it spilled into the crowd and right. uh, Pacers and, and Pistons basically became a, a brawl of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. Right. And way past any of our expectations right. about it's just, what an NBA fight could be like. Right. Exactly. And, and, you know, seeing that play out live, um, and again, I don't think I was watching the Pacers Pistons mid season game for any reason, sure. right? <laughs> but I happened to be watching ESPN or something at the mm. time and said, and you know, we're getting breaking news on it. So I managed to flip over and watch the game, uh, watch oh. what was no longer a game. No. And so broken the codes of what it meant to play a sporting event and it now transferred into something else. And I, I felt that way during the first debate. I don't know if you did. Um, the, yeah. Right. That we had just gone beyond what was the norms of, and this is a norm breaking presidency. It's very clear that that's mm -hmm. had a positive effect for the president in a number of different ways, but, right. um, but uh, the norm breaking debate of just talk over your opponent, talk over the moderator, um, instigate, terrify, you know, do, do all this. And, and then at the end, we get to the question about white supremacy and the president somehow manages to uh, what uh, Fox's Brian Kilmeade said, blow the easiest layup in the history of presidential debates. Yeah. Are you against white supremacy? And managed to take that to a declaration to the Proud Boys, a, a group, by the way, that has affected your hometown yeah mm -hmm. in ways that are that anyone anyone with a brain would call negative watching um, them go from from instigators to then you know watching the people of portland try to stand up against them and then the denouncement of antifa after that now they are defending against inst a problem that to stop them oh it's so uh, it just bends my mind it right. makes me so angry so for you and me from the pacific northwest <laughs> We know the Proud Boys. We've seen mm -hmm. them up close, and we know they are a maleficent force. They are not. Mm -hmm. They are not uh, helping 
in any no, way, and they are only hurt anyone. Yeah, um, the president manages to say the words, st- stammer out the words, "Proud boys, stand back and stand by." And that was that moment that, you know, I was sitting there thinking about that co-op mode essay, right? Uh-huh. Right of like, wow, you know, he really is playing a cooperative game with white supremacists he doesn't maybe he doesn't fully acknowledge it in his head like there's some possibility for some interference here where where he believes he's playing you know he's those those people are okay up until the point that they commit violent acts and then they're not on his side anymore right it's entirely possible but it could yeah um but i definitely i i agree with you there's there's got to be a fundamental feeling that you know, there is, this is part of getting reelected is making sure these people stay on his side. <laughs> so saying no, uh, or being uh, against them would be a huge problem for uh, his personal, I'm, I'm going to be reelected and win this thing. Yeah. And yet, I mean, yeah. I think the, the, the end result is that far more people went in that moment. I just saw the president fail to denounce white supremacy mm-hmm. in front of my eyes. You know, and that is, you know, in a in a debate which had many storylines, many things you could point to. Right. The the thing that dominated after that point was the president just gave the Proud Boys a new t shirt slogan. Yeah. Yeah, they changed their logo within the hour. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. In live time, right? In live time. It wasn't even like like the next day or whatever, nope. right? It was during the um you know, because that happened like probably with, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes to go in the debate, maybe 20. Yeah. I don't remember exactly. Um, and because, uh, uh, well, maybe it was a little longer because we still had the disaster of the president not committing to have a peaceful transition of power if he okay, lost. Right. So I guess maybe it was as much as 30 or 40 minutes before then. Mm-hmm. As the anchors came out of that and they were saying uh, that was a train wreck you know, they were showing images in live time of the daily, of of the Proud Boys websites with all these t-shirts now for sale, all these, no, I mean, you felt like you were in the middle of something that if you had had it explained to you a month later, you just would say stop. Right? Absolutely. I can't can't process Mm -hmm. anymore, but we're watching it live and I, you know, I mean, I don't know. It's recency bias is a real thing, right? Um, it's possible in four years. I won't think of this as one of those moments, you know, challenger, like at the level of where I was when the challenger blew up. Sure. Right. But I kind of feel that way. Um, yeah. Like th- there have been some moments this year that have been at the level where there was no water cooler talk the next day about anything else. Mm-mm. Right. There was no, the, the, the world just stopped, or at least the United States, I wasn't anywhere else. So I can't presume that sure. it's yeah. true. But the United States just stopped mm-hmm. and said, we're going to take a collective analysis of who we are right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Right? Because it was just like, just like there, there's no way around it. The president just, the president of the United States, sitting president of the United States, just signaled to white supremacists that he was cool with them. Right. And then before, you know, spend some time processing, consider what work to be done. And then there's already the next thing we get. Um, yeah. How 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 soon was, was tax returns? How soon tax- was... So yeah, so good. <laughs> so I, I I know the sequence, right? That was on a yeah. Tuesday, mm-hmm. right? So Amy Coney Barrett um, uh, announced on a Saturday, right? We know this sequence. Tuesday, the debate, right? Obviously, the announcement of Amy Coney Barrett, super spreader event. Nobody knows it at the time. Right, don't, that's right. Don't presume that, you know, I'm, I'm, I talk a lot about conspiracy theories, but I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I do not believe that the president knew upon getting off the plane in 
uh, in Ohio that he was contagious or anything like that. I'm sure. sure it's not. But, you know, <laughs> you go from launch of the super spreader event debate president gets covid diagnosis on thursday or hope hicks diagnosis on wednesday president and president's wife diagnosis on thursday you know um like and then (laughs) you know and and all of this in the background you know just a couple weeks uh, just a week earlier uh ginsburg died right like this Mm -hmm. this month this month of that we are now looking back in the rear view has got to have been one of the most action packed months. You explaining it just there. I, I can't believe that was all this month. And <laughs> yeah. today is what? It's the 16th. Yeah, <laughs> I know all of that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, it, and it's just like, it's just like, um, and that's why I think this feels so different right now when we're talking about the number of, days till the election no longer really being bounded by weeks yeah there are still two weeks left but really we're down to a day count at this point Mm -hmm. right and we're in the middle of it we got 20 plus million people who voted so these these rapid developments around the barrett hearing for example um we still don't know if the senate is going to open for business next week but they sure seem like they want to yeah right because they feel like this is really important and and uh probably the most interesting you know there's a lot of reasons why a person with our sentiments might not want amy coney barrett on the court but the the most significant to me and and maybe i'm just because i think the rest of it can take care of itself in some way even critical things like Obamacare and abortion rights and gay marriage. If you have a Democratic majority in both houses and a Democratic uh, president, there's a reasonable chance you can get something like what you had before and make it bulletproof so that when it gets to a 6-3 majority and the court, you, you still win enough. Right. Mm-hmm. Like you're still at the point where where those rights are or or, or benefits are, are maintained. But you can't fix that problem if Amy Coney Barrett is on the court uh, when the, the election comes to the court. That's right. Right. Like you can't fix it if there is um, different slates of electors out of the state of Florida. And there's a 6-3 majority on the court. Like, you can't fix it <sighs> if there's um, uh, the entire election in Wisconsin is decertified and it gets to oh. the court, right? I mean, like, and all of those scenarios are in play. They are. And, and they're, they're terrifying. Like, they're, they're, they're literally keep you up at night terrifying, which sort of brings us to the last essay in the book. Right, yeah. which is, you know, you and I thought we were done. We did. We Do really did. That? You remember <laughs> when we were like the the last? I don't remember the last essay was. Um, I knew I was going to do the Kamala Harris one, and we knew mm-hmm. we were going to do that. But the the idea was that we were going to have uh, it end on kind of this cliffhanger, right? But yeah. um, but it was just going to be like. Uh, sort of look into the future and then all that stuff happened and we were just like we got to pull this thing off press Mm -hmm. gotta stop there's uh there's way more to talk about yeah because that's when you know the day after ginsburg died i sat down at my computer i wrote the longest essay i've ever written which was called a war game designer define or yeah war game designer defines our four possible civil wars right and i had none of it going into that day right it wasn't like i was planning to write this essay i wasn't planning to go deep into the civil war uh, analogy or anything like that but that was when you know i wrote it down i'm like and i kind of wrote angry in a weird way Mm -hmm. like it's not a hopeful essay it doesn't give you ways out that you can just feel confident in it just says um 
you know, even the best election scenario produces potentially one of the worst results. And, right. and, uh, for some reason that became the, you know, the, the most shared essay I have ever written about anything. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, because it hit people right, right in the chest. It's a, it's like a, a good emblem of just, Hey, by the way, you know, we, we look at this divide and, you know, as we were just weeks before, you know, hoping that things are going to kind of re knit together and the, the fabric is going to keep moving. And it was just a moment like, or not, or, yeah. you know, actually there's a divide, there's a fundamental <laughs> divide and the moment that's coming isn't necessarily just going to, you know, it's not just going to vanish. It's not going to get fixed just no. in, in November, you know, this is, I think we were, can be all sorts of things. We fell into the same trap that the president fell into when confronted with the coronavirus, right? We, we fell into yeah. that sense of you and I are institutionalists, right? We mm -hmm. believe that, you know, even if, even if policing is broken, right? Even if yeah. healthcare is not a fundamental right, even if, uh, the um, balance of, uh, you know, uh, what you will make is defined by what the color of your skin is or what your gender is. Those are all terrible things. You and I are still institutionalists. We think our institutions are going to save us from right. the worst possible results. Mm -hmm. That we can't presume the best possible results. That's, we would like that, but that is that not, nice. that is not... <laughs> given to us that right. is something that has to be forged by our collective effort mm -hmm. but the worst possible result never comes right because right. because we have we've built these buffers we've built these people that are keeping us you know moving onward <laughs> the, remember the first <sighs> thing in the book right where uh where hamilton the hamilton quote in the book right uh which i said something like um Alexander Hamilton had this one, right? Where he says, the truth unquestionably is that the only path to a subversion of the Republican system of the country is by flattering the prejudices of the people and exciting their jealousies and apprehensions to throw affairs into confusion and bring on civil commotion. When a man unprincipled in private life, desperate in his fortune, bold in his temper, possessed of considerable talents, having the advantage of military habits, despotic in his ordinary demeanor, known to have scoffed in private at the principles of liberty, when such a man is seen to mount the hobby horse of popularity to join in the cry of danger to liberty to take every opportunity of embarrassing the general government and bring it under suspicion to flatter and fall in with all the nonsense of the zealots of the day it may justly be suspected that his object is to throw things into confusion that he may ride the storm and direct the whirlwind you know i mean even as i wrote those words into the introduction of the last version of this book when yeah. you know president had done the charlottesville thing and he's you know heading toward impeachment i don't know that i believed it right it's it seems too far like you you read that and i i was just like ah there's machiavelli right there you know in that context it's it's the pure chaos for personal gain and there was still a feeling in me that that wasn't the whole of it like there was some of yeah. that you know, yeah, I, it wasn't the whole of it. Exactly. Right. And then, it, no, it's the whole of it. It's the whole of it. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's amazing to me that we are sitting on this precipice of legitimate armed conflict and, you know, the complete crumbling of, of all of the structures that I grew up in as a white heterosexual moderately affluent person just presume are going to be there for me forever and and benefit me uh because of the privilege that i have um no they could all be gone mm -hmm. they could all be gone and they they might still exist for people like me right but they could be gone for the vast majority of of the country and it feels like that's that's where we are we're three weeks out two and a half weeks out 
from finding out the answer to the question, does this institutionalist philosophy that we have, is it all just a sham? Right. Because it's, I, I don't, when I look through my history books, I don't see the same tests in the same ways, you know, as yeah. I've, I've never thought I would have to see this. <laughs> I never thought I'd be sitting there trying as I'm writing this last essay, mm -hmm. you know, going through like, okay, obviously we're going to talk about the American Civil War and I know what happened to get us there. Yeah. And I know what happened to cause the Russian Revolution. And I know what happened to cause the Irish War of Independence. And, oh, geez, I know what happened to cause the, the Rwandan Civil War. You know, right. that these are all not far-fetched scenarios. They're, they're not going to play out the way they, they have in the past. We know that. Sure. It's not, that's not the point. The point is that, that this is where we could be if we decide that our institutions are not enough. And so, so yeah, I mean, it, it's a really interesting way to end the book. It, it definitely became a very different kind of cliffhanger. It did. Right? It, did. it went from being like the cliffhanger of who will win this epic struggle of kaiju, right? You know, it feels, <laughs> you know it's kind of, that's kind of how we, we had it the first time, right? Where that's we're true. just like, uh -huh. like, these are, these are giant monsters that are rampaging across the country, but one of them has to win. Right. No. And we, we've talked a whole lot about which one it should be. And yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that was to it. <laughs> what if, in fact, um, this is not that movie, but, you know, all the the world dis ending disaster movies. Yeah. Right. And so which still has some kaiju in it. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. But but, you know, we're like this is this is where we are now. Um, but it all feels like I don't know about you. This is this is probably like I'm going to look back on this and feel like a complete sucker if it all goes wrong. I still feel like the institutions are going to win. I, I, I mean, I have to keep hoping. That's that's what, well, that's I, don't, what I want. I'm that's not what I've been grown to believe. I'm not oh, even yeah? saying I'm hoping. I'm saying it's in the bag, right? I mean, like, like I still believe it to the mm -hmm. core of my being that yeah. that even with this six-three majority on the court and stuff like that even with all of this with 393 million guns in the hands of civilians you know only a million of which are registered um even with the plot to kidnap the governor of michigan can you believe that we've gotten to the end of this and that the plot to kidnap a governor hasn't yeah. come up before this right 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 I didn't even mention that in the list of crazy it's things that's unbelievable. happened. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, even with all of that fraying, not just at the edges, but at the core, mm -hmm. I'm still the guy who's going to say, I'm not saying we got this. It's still hard. Sure. But but we will have it. And the the end result will be that we will pivot back to being a country of laws and morals mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, you know, built in with all the other stuff that we have in the United States that isn't so good, like, you know, empire and, and fossil fuel addiction and, yeah. and all the things that mm -hmm. we, like we have lots of inherent problems, but, right. but I at least want to get back to there and right. Yes. And my brain says that's <laughs> what we're going to do. I think our, you know, our, our history of, I, I don't want to say self-correcting, but, but that there is like, a, there's like an American thoroughfare. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, we're going to get there. <laughs> right. Because the, uh, the other option to use that analogy is that there's a bridge out sign, right? Mm -hmm. We're still driving on this road at high speed. Yeah. There's a bridge out sign and we're just going to plunge and we don't have any plan for what happens mm -hmm. under that right we just don't have a plan nope. and so yeah i mean I, I guess i just sort of believe that the road is going to continue to be paved yeah. all the way um because <laughs> we are definitely driving at the highest speed this car can handle 
We are, and, uh, and right now it's a little foggy out. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, yeah. Um, I mean, how many times a day do you check five thirty-eight? Gosh, at this point, it's it's pretty often. There was there was a little bit where my my polling heart uh, had fallen apart, but yeah. uh, at this point, I'm back to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because we're still horse race people, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We're still we're still game designers. We're still game players, mm -hmm. right? We're not disconnecting from that reality because the reality of this book and of 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 game theory in general is that it's kind of a little bit addictive. Yeah, it's right. True. It's and, like you know. <laughs> It's, it's you get in there we, and it's a series of moves. It's so many moves. Yeah, <laughs> you gotta watch. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and 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 fundamentally, these are rational actors. Like they're not. I mean, every move that the president has made is predictable. Yeah, it doesn't make it right. You know, it doesn't make it. It just because he's made a decision that he believes is rational doesn't mean it's the best move for him. Right. Right. Cause he doesn't have perfect information as we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. but, and he sure doesn't filter well. No. Um, but, <laughs> um, but, but it all still feels logical in a weird way, just insane in, in a backdrop of complete insanity. Yep. Yeah, you can still see that there are people and they are gaining benefits by those actions. And as long as we're paying attention to those, we know the actions are rational somewhere, even if they seem chaotic and out of nowhere, right? That's that's the the core of, you know, that's the prince right there. Yeah, <laughs> the prince I think, I, the does, last it, four does it ever, <laughs> can you ever get to the point where somebody posts the thing? I know I never reply to this, but I'm, I'm, I'm always uh -huh. want to, where somebody will post the following thing. <laughs> How can people who call themselves good Christians support this president? Who, or how can people, right? And the, I mean, the answer is people betray their own self-interest all the time for all sorts of good reasons, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yeah. like, yeah. there's not just one, there's not just one thing that everybody wants. And you just, once you define yourself a certain way, people lie to themselves all the time. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. the point is, what do they actually want? And in some cases... It's as simple as the other guys lose. Yeah. Right. Sometimes Zero. that's the most important thing. And then figure it out from there. <laughs> Zero sum thinking. And we, we <laughs> managed to put the most zero sum person in charge of our country. And we've learned what that looks like. And yeah. we have another yeah. option. I mean, you can, there's all sorts of negative all sorts of things you could say that might be negative about Joe Biden. One of them sure. that you cannot say is that he thinks of the world as a zero sum game. Every decision, every decision he makes is like, how do the most people benefit from this uh, decision? And, That's you know, you might not agree with the principles under which he makes those decisions. That's totally legit. You might think he's mm -hmm. too soft on, on fossil fuel companies or too cozy with the police or any number of different things, but, yeah. but it's not about him. Like, I mean, that's the, that's the most important thing. Like it's, it's just not about him to yeah. him. Right. His decisions are going to be made with that in mind. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's, that's it. <laughs> that's what, uh, it's what we need. And, you know, and in his running mate, he got the person who got squeezed out of the lane battle that we talked about earlier, right? Mm -hmm. And somehow became the most progress powerful progressive in the country. That's a weird sentence on its own. It right? is. Um, <laughs> so it's like, it's true. yeah, it's, it, it, we're, we're facing an interesting, you know, I mean, like the next, the next 20 days, let's say, you know, for all the days that have built up so far where they've just been felt like the most consequential period of our lifetime, and they might, this next 20 days might also fit that description. That's true. This may not end. <laughs> um, I just, I feel like you know, one of the things, you know, as I, as I'm looking forward to the next 20 days to the next three years, you know, what, however, I know it's four, but I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the next year, well, two we've, years, we've three years, four the last years, you know? year, We've learned the last <laughs> year doesn't, isn't the same as the first three. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I do think that that the stuff that that you have looked at, like the the scenarios you've laid out in these essays, the the, the way I've tried to add them in, I think we have. You know, like you talked at the beginning, like you built this 
this primer and that's how I, I want to look at this, sure. this thing that we've made, you know, is looking forward at what are the tools that we can use to see these things in the future? Cause they're not stopping They're you know, no. <laughs> these, these conflicts, these problems, you know, we can see your last essay points out like they're, they're not going away. No. There isn't going to be a fix. No. And so. I don't think anybody expects this to be some sort of magic no. bullet that, that, mm -mm. that changes everything. I mean, the list of Joe Biden kicked off the four crises that we're in. And you know, when you talk about yeah. things like, like disease and economy and racism and and uh and the climate those aren't things that just flip mm -mm. on a dime mm -mm. right that's we're gonna not, have that's... but it would be <laughs> nice to actually that. <laughs> no but it would be nice to actually start from trying to fix them mm -hmm. right yeah. i mean like that's the yes. choice that people have in front of them is would you like to try to fix those things or would you like those things to completely fester for the next four years right and right. i think it's a pretty clear choice is why i why i'm an institutionalist even now right because mm -hmm. the self-interest of americans is to not be huddled inside waiting for the you know the uh disease to come across their front door and kill their firstborn like this isn't isn't how we do this thing right and so we don't respond well when 33 million people file for unemployment in a week right that's just not us mm -hmm. it's not america no and no. so uh this this too i think shall pass fairly quickly um but we're gonna be stuck with a lot of this stuff for a while and i yeah. i, I yeah. feel like you know we'll we'll know you know you know, let's let's look at this on December fifteenth. Let's look back at this broadcast <laughs> after mm -hmm. what I imagine will be a fairly interesting meeting of the electors. Sure. Right. Yeah. And see if it all worked out. See if it all, you know, got past the point where we have to worry about, you know, court challenges and potential mm -hmm. people taking up arms. Maybe maybe we just get through it. Yeah. And we just show up in January and uh can have a day of joy. <laughs> right I gotta admit, admit, the thing I'm looking forward to most, if, if, if all goes well, if all goes the way I want it to go, mm -hmm. the thing I'm looking forward to most is that when I wake up in the morning on a given day, I do not first look at CNN. Yep. Right. I do not first look at yeah. Twitter to see yeah. what, what the president has tweeted. I'm not absolutely certain that Joe Biden has Twitter on his phone. Yeah, I'm not so sure. Like, I mean, that. his Twitter That's account, point. his Twitter account <laughs> really doesn't feel like, I mean, it's, it's him, it's his voice, right? Like, I mean, yeah, but it's repeating things he actually said in front of a group of people. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> like, 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 so, so, I mean, it's not, it's not that it's not him talking, but mm -hmm. it's not him talking, if you know what I mean. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And especially us, you know, being on the West Coast, the by the time I look at my phone, I know everyone else has been active for hours. Right, exactly. <laughs> and the, exactly. the doom has already begun. The cloud has spread. Yeah. And, like, uh, wouldn't it be great to yeah. just wake up in the morning and just know that the federal government's just doing what it's doing, but that doesn't it's, affect you today? No, no. Today is going to be, <laughs> maybe a thing happens and I'll find out about that thing, right? <laughs> but, but in the morning, I don't have to worry about what it is. Right. You don't have to redo your day. No. Based no. on that thing. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I hope we're, I hope we're um, in the, the next year or so, we're still talking about game theory, but we're talking about mm -hmm. it about games. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we're talking right. about, you know, just sports and, and, mm -hmm. and and gameplay and 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 you know people just doing things to get along i hope we're still doing that as opposed to yeah. whatever it is we're doing now right right ah <laughs> wow 2021 2021 i i hear that's the year after 2020 i whenever it gets here yeah. it's <laughs> It's, I think it's three years away. <laughs> it could be, I, or it could, or it could come rocket fast. That's the other thing. Oh, is like, I, I admit that it feels like 2020 has been 20 years long, and yet March feels like yesterday. In some weird way, 
right to me like when was the last time i was on an airplane it was in march right i mean Mm -hmm. and so so you know it could be over with before we know it and um and i'll be very interested to see how people react when you know they can read the book now um Mm -hmm. but when they physically get their copies of it right they crack it open and all right i'm gonna read this thing you know how much of it feels quaint how much of it feels right. right? Like how much of it feels alarmist? How much of it feels, you know, because you'll be able to look back on it and say, we made something that reflected the tenor of the times. Exactly. Yeah. Right. This, the age of chaos is such a perfect name for this book. And I, I want that to be encapsulated <laughs> and I want to move past it. Right. <laughs> right. right. It is specifically this age of chaos, which goes right. from 2017 mm-hmm. to 2020 <laughs> and no further. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can only hope. This yeah, has been a really good can. conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah. my gosh. We should do this more often. <sighs> okay. All right. Well not not for this book. We're no, no the book is done. <laughs> well, I mean if you're still here uh, we encourage you to go to the Kickstarter campaign and check out the the book, um, assuming that it's still running, the campaign's still running. Um, also go to shark.vote if you're interested in uh, doing things to help the electoral process. If you do them, then you can get a free copy of the book. Um, Rich, thank you so much for being my partner through these ne- last four years of just complete nonsense. <laughs> of course, of course. And, it's been... Uh, it's been an experience. It has been. I'm kind of there too. It's, it's like it's, it's and now we can call that done. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be real yes. nice. Be real nice. All right. Well, thanks everybody for watching, and uh, we'll see you in the new year.